Welcome back to the second part after we had the cake. And uh, so thank you, Jim, again. Thank you, George. Let's go on. Thank you to you and Swilly for the cake. If I fall asleep during my own lecture, it's your fault. Okay, sure. All, all, all. Uh, okay. So I'm, go I'm going to tempt fate. I'm going to try and run code again, but this time no downloading from the internet. Uh, all right, so here's an outline of this lecture, which is about pricing. So we're going to assume that our model under P is correct, or some version of this thing is correct. And then we're going to examine the consequences of this model for pricing of options. So uh, first of all, we show some pictures of volatility surface. Then we look at the consequences for that model under P. We look to see how it should look under Q. Then we look at a very simple, case, uh, simple example of this, and we end up with a generalization of the Bergomi model, um, which is well known. Then in passing, I mentioned the rough Heston model, which is another uh, a rough volatility model that we've been talking about a reasonable length during the questions. Then I'll mention some computations uh, concerning VIX futures. It's also an easy way to calibrate H. And then um, we'll look uh, at application of all this, put, rolling it all, all up into some kind of big sausage machine where essentially we can take uh, historical price data as input, let's say tick data as input, and spit out, in some sense, the shape of the volatility surface as output. So this is like the holy grail for traders in Chicago, let's say, how can we take high frequency data as an input and spit out the fair uh, shape of the volatility surface as an output. And I hope to convince you that this is indeed possible. Right, so how does the volatility surface look? This is a very famous volatility surface, this one. For those of you who bought my book, you know this is the one in the book, right? So it's uh, from September the 15th. Why September 15th? Well, that's because it's a Thursday before the Friday, triple witching. And so it means in particular that we can observe very, very short dated options. And we see that this volatility surface is a beautiful shape, so beautiful that the initial reviewer of the book believed that this was completely cooked a la biology paper, but no, this is real. Um, so if I were to give you a smile, let's say three months smile from the S&P, and I were to ask you what kind of model generates this smile, honestly the answer is any model generates this smile. The only thing that that single smile will tell you is that people are not sure what volatility is going to be. In other words, if they sell an option, they're not sure how much it's going to cost to hedge that thing. And the second thing it tells you, the negative skew tells you that in general, when the market falls, volatility goes up, right? So these are very simple things. And any model with these properties is going to be compatible with the smile. So then you ask yourself, is there any feature of the volatility surface that would allow us to say more about the underlying dynamics? And I claim that the feature that we want to look at is the term structure of at the money skew. So it's implicit in the above that more or less any model that's consistent with those observations be able to fit a given smile. Fitting two or more smiles simultaneously is much harder. And then this makes us think of the Ramacont paper, the most cited paper in quantitative finance, the ones that says there is bar barely a single model that, uh, that rep replicates even you know, a couple of the stylized facts of the time series or option prices. I'd like to claim that rough volatility uh, is consistent with many of these stylized facts. Um, but conventional stochastic volatility models cannot fit several smiles at once. Sabre, which is the worst case, can only fit one smile at a time. So the way it's used in, in practice is every expiration is a different underlying, essentially. So given one smile for a fixed expiration, little can be said about the process generating it. In contrast, the dependence of the smile on time to expiration is intimately related to the underlying dynamics. In particular, we can focus on what I call psi, which is a uh, first derivative of the implied volatility with respect to log strike, 
at log strike equals zero, in other words, at the money. It's very sensitive to the underlying dynamics. So let's draw a picture of this thing for that beautiful volatility surface. Nowadays, by the way, uh, I think this had eight expirations, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, today, if you were to look at the S&P volatility surface, there are like 35 expirations. Uh, now, what is that red curve that seems to fit through all these points? That red curve is just a power law. And, well, we've got trouble resolving. We've got trouble with the graphics today. But it's tau to the minus 0.44. And so in the context of a rough volatility model, as you will see, this indicates that H should have been about 0 0.06, a half minus H on this particular day in history. So if I were to show you this volatility surface, and I, and I were to eliminate the axes, and ask you which day in history did this volatility surface come from, you would not be able to tell me, because basically every day since 1987, since October 1987, every day, the volatility surface is this shape. It's basically, big picture, a constant, right? The shape is a constant. Of course, the level is different, the orientation may be a little different, the wings may be a little tighter, but if I just show you the picture, you can't tell me which day it came from. So unless you are, unless you have, you are in the middle of a spiral, then perhaps you have the money to work. Yeah, but even then, you know, if I don't give you the orientation now, uh, right? So you're saying, okay, well, no. maybe it looks like this, but you know, if I just give you a vol surface floating in space, and I, then you can't tell. Even even there, you can't tell. So this motivates us to think of a time homogeneous model. Basically, volatility surface is always the same shape. And each day, you look at the term structure of at the money skew, although these days the market is getting so tight that actually it has a lot more structure. But until very recently, this kind of power law fit was almost perfect. Now, conventional stochastic volatility models generate volatility surfaces that are inconsistent with this observation. In stochastic vol models, the at-the-money volatility skew is constant for short dates. I don't mean that it tends to some limit. What I mean is that for very short dates, uh, let's say maybe one week or two weeks, the skew is the same. In other words, it's a constant. Um, and it's inversely proportional to time for long dates, right? So a conventional reaction to that, uh, I'm gonna like, this is annoying, so I'm gonna, here where that, that fixed it. So empirically, it's just a simple power law. The conventional solution is just to introduce more volatility factors. So this is like saying, let's add a bunch of decaying exponentials and approximate the power law. And of course, if you do that, the more exponentials you add, the more parameters you get. So rapidly, you get a pretty ugly model with many, many parameters. Whereas the model of nature that seems to be the correct one is very simple. There's only one parameter, alpha. So you could imagine the power law decay of at the money skew to be the result of adding or averaging many subprocesses, each of which is characteristic of a trading style with a particular time horizon. So this makes one think of Fulvio Corsi with his trading on the one day, one week, one month horizon. There's a very recent paper by Eduardo Abijaber who looks at simulating the rough Heston model by taking 500 uh, conventional stochastic volatility models and adding them all up. Uh, again, these concepts are all related and somehow this magical scaling that we see in the data is related to summing uh, the, the impacts of trading over many different time scales, some kind of cascade of time scales. Why the time scales can cascade in such a magical way that you get a perfect power law, I have no idea. This is a paper that could and should be written sometime in the future. For the moment, we don't know. Now, I want to, okay. Last time we had problem with computation, now we have uh, problem with uh, right the slides. Uh, sorry. 
Bergomi. Yeah. So now, a, originally, Bergomi is the same Bergomi who is head of quant at SOCGEN and Julien Guillon, he's going to be speaking at this conference. He works for Bruno at Bloomberg in New York, uh, but he used to work for Bergomi in Paris. They suggested that it's natural to express stochastic volatility models in so-called forward variance form. Why? Because forward variances are tradable. What is a forward variance? It's the expectation under the pricing measure of future instantaneous variance. And again, this should be familiar from lecture one because in lecture one, we were computing expectation of future variance under P. We called that volatility forecast. Here, we're calling this uh, forward variance. This is not only in principle tradable, it is actually tradable because variance swaps are traded in the market. You can get quotes, two-way quotes from any dealer. And by taking the derivative of a variance swap with respect to time to maturity, you end up with the forward variance curve. So again, it's stochastic volatility, so this is just Black-Scholes, except that the volatility is moving around according to some dynamics, so we have some kind of d-dimensional process going on here. But notice that forward variances, because they're tradable, they're martingales, right? So they are natural underlyings for any stochastic volatility model, and any conventional stochastic volatility model, in fact, any rough volatility model can be written in this form. Moreover, as pointed out by uh, Omar and Mathieu, models written in forward variance form are explicitly Markovian in the stock and in the forward variance curve. And so European payoffs may be perfectly hedged. The delta hedging strategy involves holding the usual amount of underlying asset and exactly what you would imagine would be the right amount of forward variance. Yeah, that's better. So it's a nice story. Everything is re replicable in these models, at least in principle. Oh. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I should uh, try some other trick. Let's try Safari. Then, if this works, I'll get a prize. Then, uh, okay, so we go to IPython. Can you see it here? Uh, sh we go to IPython. Then we go to courses and workshops. Then we go to Buzios. And then we try this one. Now, we try this, and we try view full screen, and let's see if we do better with Safari. Or is it just as bad? It's just as bad. <laughs> okay, so, uh, Bergomi Guillon, Another piece of work by the same people. Oh, no. Oh, jeez. I can't believe this. There is... All right. Let's go back to here. <laughs> That's uh, Chrome. Chrome is doing better than Safari so far. Right. So according to Bergomi and Guillon, in the context of a variance curve model, implied vol may be expanded in the following form. Um, so the point here is, and actually they expanded to second order. They didn't go, uh, so they expanded to second order in vol of vol. So the implied volatility for a given log strike and expiration is given by at the money vol plus something proportioned to log strike. And then they have a higher order term, something proportional to k squared. And you can see that W is just the variance swap, so this is easy. Um, CXI, on the other hand, is the interesting term. They call this a spot vol autocovariance functional. So the real beautiful thing about their work is, given a model written in forward variance form, you can immediately write down what the term structure of uh, at the money skew should be. Conversely, if you observe term structure of at the money skew in the market, you can immediately assess whether it's compatible with a proposed model. 
and now we're going to have more work to do today. So if we, as an example, we can consider the Bergomi model. So the Bergomi model says that uh, the, the forward variance curve at some future date is given by the forward variance curve today times a stochastic exponential. Um, in other words, an exponential whose expectation is one. And the argument of the expectation is, uh, the argument of the exponential is just a sum of ornstein nullenbeck processes. Now, in its typical impl implementation, little n is just equal to two. So we have two factors. And uh, in such a model, you will see that the term structure of at the minus q is basically a sum of n decaying exponentials. And so now you think about the real data. The real data is a power law, one over tau to the alpha. And here we have a sum of decaying exponentials. And if you add enough of them together, over, then over a sufficiently large region, suppose you carefully, um, uh, you carefully match the parameters, you're going to get pretty good approximation to a power law. So that's the conventional reaction. But for very small tau, it's still a constant. And for very large tau, it's still one over tau, right? Incompatible with the power law. So we, decide, we look at this and we say, OK, why do we have this ugly term structure of at the money skew? Well, obviously, it's related to this kernel. And it's easy to see, in fact, that if you replace this kernel with a power law kernel, then you would be able to generate the term structure of skew that we observe in the market. Ah, OK. OK, better. Right, so basically, what we want to do is to see if we can rip out this exponential kernel. In fact, that's where I started back in 2005. And Bergomi told me he had the same idea, which let's get rid of this exponential kernel and replace it with a power law kernel. Now, if you're just, you just do that to play around and see what would happen, you end up with a non-Markovian model. What does it mean, non-Markovian model? Well, you lose PDE, you lose Ito's lemma. Everything depends on the entire history of the world since the Big Bang. And so you say, okay, how am I going to compute option price? I need the history of S&P uh, in the early universe, right? It's going to be important for my option price. So it doesn't sound very practical, but as you will see very quick, as you will see very soon, if I work hard enough to regenerate these slides, um, it actually does make sense. So it's tempting to replace the exponential kernel with a power law kernel, and that would give a model of that form. And this looks rather similar to that model, which is now looking very much like lecture one, because here we have the variance, the log of the variance is basically proportional to fractional Brownian motion. It's not really fractional Brownian motion, but it's something similar. So now, the model that I just uh, projected there uh, belongs to a larger class of fractional stochastic volatility models that were originally shown by Alice and then by Fukasawa to generate a short dated at the money skew of that form. So that formalizes the intuition that if you were able to replace the kernel, you were, if you were able to replace the exponential kernel with a power law kernel, then indeed you would generate the right term structure of skew. Um, so in the last lecture, we, sh we saw that the distributions of differences in log realized variance are close to Gaussian. Um, and so that motivates us to model V, and so whatever that is, and so the vol, sigma, as a log normal random variable. Uh, moreover, we have the RFSV model, if you remember, and probably I need to regenerate this, otherwise this slide is also incomprehensible. Right, there we go. So this is the model that we ended up with in lecture one. It just says the differences in log vol are proportional to differences in fractional Brownian motion. <laughs> right, so here's the autocovariance function 
of fractional Brownian motion again. We remember that from lecture one. Uh, h equals a half gives us classical Brownian motion. H less than a half gives us a very rough time series. And H greater than a half gives us a smooth time series. And again, we're going to want to Sorry? We are learning how to program. <laughs> yeah. A, we're going to use the Mandelbrot van Ness representation. And the real reason that this is the only, present, uh, the only representation that makes sense for us is because it starts at minus infinity. If we choose any other date, then that date ends up being a special date. And uh, essentially, we pick up a scale in our model which we don't want to have. Okay, so now I can see I'm gonna to have to work very hard here. I have never had this problem. So now let's write down our model using this representation, the RFSV model, which basically says the log of volatility is just proportional to fractional Brownian motion. Ah, right, okay, so we are choosing that. And then we write down. Uh, uh, James, yeah. So just uh, I was looking. Sorry. Yeah. Let me follow my predicament. So, so can you give a little bit of intuition on this uh, Mandelbrot? Uh, uh, well, finesse? okay. So essentially, this term is irrelevant. Uh -huh. uh, this term is just like renormalization, right? So if we consider differences in fractional Brownian motion, which is all that's going to concern us for our model, this term just cancels out, right? So it's just history of Brownian motion since the Big Bang, discounted, if you like, with this par parallel kernel. Yeah, so, so the point is the discounting with respect to the power. Yeah, and uh, this uh, is generating the required singularity. As s goes to little t, uh -huh. this is singular. And the singularity is exactly the right one to generate the path with roughness that we need. I see. If we had exponential in here or anything that didn't have a singularity, mm -hmm. then in that case, we would end up with a semi-martingale volatility process. Right, right. right. Yeah, so yeah. this singularity here is the key. That's what makes a model rough. We can have anything we want up here. So if you recall in that Miko Pakenen paper, in the quote, he said, oh, a distributions are not Gaussian. So he was arguing for putting something more complicated up here next to the DW. Uh, in the case of the rough uh, Heston model, we'll have a square root of VS up here uh, next to the DW. All of these things are kind of big picture irrelevant for roughness. The only thing that matters for roughness is this singularity as S goes to T. So right. we can make this kernel as complicated as we want so long as it has the singularity, we're going to have a rough volatility model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so, so yes, yeah, this first time I, I really face this. B because the technical issue here is that unless you normalize it, renormalize it, uh, this thing doesn't converge at Yeah, but we, yeah. for modeling, we only care about differences, right? Right, right. I I'm agree. here today, <laughs> I want to know what's happening right. in three months' time, yeah. so okay. I only care about differences. Right. <laughs> And here it is. Here is exactly that intuition. So now I've split. So I'm taking the difference between the log of the variance, instantaneous variance at some future date u, let's say three months, subtracting off the log of the instantaneous variance today. And well, we saw that what that was from the previous slide, but I've chosen to split it in a different way. I've chosen to split it into a piece that we don't know that you can see is a martingale part. It's martingale and little t. And a piece that we do know. In other words, a piece that's adapted to the filtration. So I call this M for, for martingale and Z. Well, Z in the literature, I'm not sure why it's called Z. But this is the part that probably turned people off these non-Markovian models because they say, well, Z, you know, okay, I need to know the history of everything to be able to price options. and. Even if I were given this information, what would I do with it? It sounds like a pretty tough computational problem. However, here is the trick, which is completely illegible. Okay. 
Here is the trick. Uh, well, this is just notation, right? So this is a kind of fractional Brownian motion. It's not technically fra fractional Brownian motion. It's called a riemann liouville process, it's some kind of Volterra process. It has the same singularity as fractional Brownian motion. And then we see here that we can, this is our original split. It says that the log of the vol is proportional to this kind of strange fractional Brownian motion, this riemann liouville process plus this extra piece that we didn't know what to do with. But by definition, if P was equal to Q, which let's say it is for the moment, it is in all the classical literature. If P were equal to Q, this would be expectation under P times stochastic exponential. Aha, if P were equal to Q, this is the forward variance curve, right? So in other words, from the forward variance curve that we can observe in the market, because variance swaps are traded, even if variance swaps were not traded, you probably know the variance swaps can be replicated using the log strip. In other words, strips of options that are traded in the market. So one can quite easily estimate variance swaps even if they're not traded. This is obviously an equality. So in other words, what we're saying is this thing that you don't want to have to deal with, you don't know it, and even if you were to get it, you wouldn't know what to do with it, it is embedded the information about this thing, which is needed for pricing options, is embedded in the forward variance curve. So that is the trick. The conditional distribution, I'm going to get some more technology here, otherwise I'm going to get repetitive strain injury. connect. Now it's easier. Okay. <laughs> the conditional distribution of this three-month instantaneous variance, instantaneous variance in three months' time, depends on the filtration only through the variance forecasts. I carefully call them variance forecasts because now we're complete conf conflating P with Q. And we're going to see in the simple model that we look at next, we're actually going to turn this into the forward variance curve. So to price options, you don't need to know the entire history of the fractional Brownian motion. The precise information that you need to price options is embedded in the forward variance curve. So now, let's make the change of measure from P to Q. Our model under P uh, reads this. Now consider some general change of measure where lambda could be anything, it could depend on anything at all. Lambda has a natural interpretation as the price of volatility risk, and in that case we can rewrite two as this thing. Okay, so now the question is, um, what is lambda and uh, should it be random and so on? Well, it clearly should be, because if you make lambda deterministic, if you believe this whole story and lambda is deterministic, then it's pretty easy to see that this is log normal. And then if you look at, for example, options on the VIX, their smile should be flat. Well, you probably know that if you look at the VIX market, the smiles are strongly upward sloping. In other words, calls on the VIX are very expensive. So that's completely incompatible with a deterministic lambda. We need to have a lambda that is big for high vol scenarios and somehow small for low volume scenarios, and that complete, that's completely consistent with the interpretation of lambda as a price of volatility risk. Essentially, the fact that out of the money calls and VIX are a hedger against just about anything, just about any crisis, uh, people need to pay for that insurance, right? So uh, lambda does need to be random to get a model that's compatible with the VIX. Uh, nevertheless, since that's too much work for us and too hard, let's just suppose that this change of measure is deterministic because this already gets us something very cool. So let's make a deterministic change of measure, this one here, and then that equation becomes this. I use lambda of s instead of lambda sub, sub s. That means it's deterministic function. 
and this becomes a forward variance curve now times this by definition. And we see the forward variance curve now consists of two pieces. It consists of my optimal forecast, which let's say comes from Fulvio or from my HAR or whatever, uh, from my um, RFSV model. So it consists of the optimal forecast with price of risk. And this is like very intuitive, right? Except they factorize out, and probably in the real world they don't factorize out like this. But now I have a very pretty picture. In other words, if I know how to forecast future instantaneous variance, and if I can somehow estimate uh, the price of volatility risk, let's say from the time series, I see I have a hedge fund trader looking at this slide carefully here. If I can do time series analysis to estimate this, uh, then I should get the forward variance curve. So in other words, by putting in historical price data, high frequency price data, I get this forecast. I have a forecast of this. I can predict the forward variance curve. And we'll see how well that works later on in this lecture. So that's essentially what I just said. So I'm not going to bother uh, a doing the slide here. So now what are some features of this model? The rough Bergomi model is a non-Markovian generalization of the Bergomi model. And what we mean by that is that it's not enough to know instantaneous variance. You need to know the entire forward variance curve. So it is Markovian, but the, its state vector is infinite dimensional, right? You need the whole forward variance curve. We have achieved our earlier aim of replacing the exponential kernels in the Bergomi model with a power law kernel. So we already kind of know, because we have the theoretical result, and from hand waving, we already know that if we are to generate prices using this model, we're going to generate the right term structure of at the money skew. Uh, also, an interesting point in pa passing is that when Bergomi introduced his model, he said this is like a market model in the style of interest rates. And uh, the forward variance curve can be anything, he said. But this is kind of unsatisfying, right? Because if you have, let's say, a two-factor Bergomi model, only certain kinds of curve are, it's only possible to generate certain kinds of curve. So somehow allowing any shape of curve is kind of inconsistent with the dynamics of the model. Here we see that essentially, if we believe this story, this uh, n-factor conventional Bergomi model is an engineering approximation. It's a Markovian engineering approximation to the rough Bergomi model, right, where you're looking at, you know, a, a lower dimensional representation of the forward variance curve. So conventional two-factor Bergomi model is then justified in practice as a tractable Markovian engineering approximation to a more realistic fractional Bergomi model. Now, what do we, we haven't talked about the stock price process so far. And, you know, we basically got the volatility process by looking at pictures, which was cool. And uh, there was essentially, with some hand waving, only one model that we could write down for the volatility process. It's not clear what we should write for the stock price process. Uh, nevertheless, just do, let's just do what everybody else did. We'll write it down as black shows, and we'll say, okay, this is the variance process, right? So black shows, but we specify some dynamics for the instantaneous variance, and that's what this is. Could it be something different? Yes, it could be. Maybe it's got something to do with time reversal asymmetry. Let's, that's something that's yet to be seen. Now, in the original pricing paper with uh, Christian Bayer and Peter Fritz, we did an exact simulation of that Volterra process, W tilde. It was horrendously slow, and certainly far too slow to be able to do any kind of calib calibration. Since then, uh, the same Miko Pakinen at Imperial uh, came up quite quickly, I must say, with the so-called hybrid BSS process. BSS stands for Brownian semi-stationary, and he was already an expert in this kind of process. It's a generalization of uh, this model. 
And uh, their, their observation is basically uh, you can use Euler scheme to uh, simulate uh, this volatility process except at the singularity where uh, the, Euler process is, uh, the Euler scheme is going to be very inaccurate. So we just have to resolve, uh, we just have to resolve the singularity. So they, instead of uh, generating all the whole, auto -covari the whole covariance matrix, they basically uh, generate just a tiny piece. And they provide a sample Jupyter notebook, so I don't know where the professor was t talking to me about using RStudio for everything, but it seems that Jupyter is not only popular with me, but with them. Okay, so here's some R code. Uh, we're gonna like uh, take a risk and see if we can run this code here. Right, so now what are these packages that I'm loading? Well, you can take a look for yourself later, but you, as you can guess, this is just Black-Scholes formula. It's got an implied vol calculation. This file here, named after Fukasawa, is a robust way of estimating the variance swaps from smiles. Lewis, uh, I don't know who's, maybe you're familiar with his book, maybe not, but he has a famous book that was written about 2000, and he has a beautiful formula that allows one to get uh, the option price directly from the characteristic function. So we're gonna be using that. Uh, there's a file called Heston Leverage, honestly, I can't remember what that, oh yeah, 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 this is Leverage Swap. Um, this is the file with the simulation, hybrid simulation, so this is the one that you're probably going to be interested in playing with the most. Uh, this is a file that allows one to take implied vols in standard form and immediately plot them. And finally, this is the one for Martino. This is the one with the rough Heston Pade approximation, right? The rational approximation to the rough Heston characteristic function. Okay, so now, why is it not going to the next? Uh, okay, there we go. So let's uh, quickly, let's go through this code and roughly explain how it's working. Uh, essentially, I'm going to generate two sets of random numbers for the volatility process. So I have uh, W and I've got, well, which stands for Gaussian, stands for standard normal random variable and an orthogonal set. And uh, is it possible to quickly explain what's going on here? Well, you can see the volatility process here. Instantaneous variance is given by the forward variance times the stochastic exponential here. W tilde of H is, where is W tilde defined here? Well, I haven't explained that. That's where the key to the hybrid scheme is. So that was kind of pointless. Uh, but anyway, you, at least you see where the code is. Now, moreover, we're gonna be super, uh, okay, this is important. I need this, not only this, but we are going to be very ambitious. We're gonna use parallel processing, which R has, R has libraries for everything. My laptop has eight CPUs, and so basically these libraries will allow me to run code in parallel, and here we go. I'm gonna run with 10,000 paths and 200 steps. Here are my parameters. So let's read them off. Um, I have H of 0 0.05, eta, which is my vol of vol of 2.5, and correlation between vol moves and spot moves is minus 0.9. My forward variance curve is gonna be very simple for this demonstration, so we're not taking too much risk. It's 16 vol flat, and I'm arranging it in that way so I get a proper function. And then, oh, I'm having real problems with the rendering of these slides. Two expiries. And then let's see if this works. Okay, Georges, can you pray now? I am already praying. <laughs> if this doesn't work, okay, it works. See, look at that, five seconds. So, I mean, it's not super fast. It's not going to be as fast as the rough Heston model that we'll de demonstrate in a minute, but it's reasonably fast. I've generated two smiles with this code. 
I'm only going to look at one of them here. I'm only going to plot the one-year smile. So here's a function to take the output of that code and plot it. And here we go. So I'm taking the output of that matrix and plotting it. I saw, well, I already said if I generate only one smile, any model could have generated that smile. But at least this model is generating a reasonable smile. OK. So the, that's now a, originally when we uh, wrote the pricing paper, as I said, we did an exact simulation and it was so slow, it was useless in practice. And then the question is, um, do we really need to calibrate? Well, what does that mean? If you don't calibrate, how do you know the parameters? Well, it turns out you can guess the parameters. Um, and that's what I'm going to show, because unlike conventional stochastic volatility models, for example, in a conventional stochastic volatility model, you have the mean reversion and you have the vol of vol, and these two parameters have pretty similar behavior, right? The vol of vol, uh, as you increase it, um, basically the skew increases, and as you increase the mean reversion, the skew decreases, and they work together, so it's pretty hard to distinguish one from the other. In this case, the parameters have very direct interpretations. H controls the decay of at-the-money skew, as we saw before, right? That generates the power law term structure of at-the-money skew. So what you do is you take the empirical at-the-money skew, you draw it on a log-log plot, and estimate H. If you're going to be much more sophisticated, as I'll show you later in the lecture, one can take the term structure of Vick's futures and estimate H from there. The product, vol of all times correlation sets the level of the at the money skew for longer, longer expiration. So let's just say one year. You play with that product until you match the level of the skew. And then having determined the product, how, you, how do you do determine rho and eta separately? Well, you look at one smile, for example, a very short dated smile, keeping this product constant. As you make rho more negative, the minimum of the smile goes to the right and lower down. So you just keep playing with that until you match. And now you have a good guess. And in fact, you can see in the picture from the paper how good that guess is. Because I guaranteed we were not able to cheat. We were not able to calibrate. Our code was so slow. Recently, uh, Christian Bayer and his student, Benjamin Stemper, showed how to calibrate the rough Bergomi model to the volatility surface using machine learning, so maybe there's some future in that. Another rough volatility model, the rough Heston model, is much more tractable. It's not only more tractable than the rough Bergomi model, its, di it's dynamics are very unreasonable, so we can't have everything. So its dynamics are rather unreasonable, and we don't know how to simulate it, unlike rough Bergomi, but it is super tractable. In fact, it is more tractable than the classical Heston model very easy to do computations. So what, how does this model look? We can see it is a natural generalization of the conventional, the classical Heston model. And again, we've just, all we've done is to replace the exponential kernel with a power law kernel. Now, um, of course, that wasn't the original motivation for this thing. This thing came naturally out of a limiting process of a microstructure model. Nevertheless, that's the process you end up with. This can be written in forward variance form. And you'll also see that not only is forward variance form the natural way to write a model, models typically look much nicer in forward variance form. And here, is no exception. Uh, so we're only going to consider the special case where mean reversion is zero. There's no reason to put mean reversion in this model. We generate perfectly nice term structure of skew with no mean reversion whatsoever. The scaling of skews and smiles comes naturally from the rough volatility aspects. So uh, this is uh, 
the equation for future variance is just the forward variance curve plus some martingale piece. And this tells us uh, the dynamics. So here are the dynamics in forward variance curve form. We have that, of course, forward variance curve has to be a martingale. So it's proportional, proportional to dw. And we have this parallel kernel. So it looks very much like rough Bergomi, except we have a square root of v here. In the case of rough Bergomi, we have the initial forward variance curve and an exponential. So the log is proportional to the Brownian motion. And here, we have some kind of, kind of square root process going on. So in a paper that I did with uh, Martin Keller Russell this year, uh, one result is to characterize when a forward variance model is affine. And it turns out a forward variance model is affine if and only if it can be written in this very simple form, right? So again, we have Black-Scholes, and then we have some process for the instantaneous variance, and it has to be in this form. In other words, we have some kernel, kappa, and we always have square root of v. And notice that it's not the whole forward variance curve here that appears in the dynamics of an affine model. It's only the square root of the instantaneous variance. So in essence, what this says is that the only possible continuous affine stochastic volatility model is the Heston model, up to a choice of kernel kappa. Moreover, we can write down the characteristic function for every such model Um, uh, do I have the, uh, maybe I've been stupid here because I haven't told you what the characteristic function looks like. Uh, let me go backwards. I, well, okay. So I haven't told you what the characteristic function looks like, but basically it's just like the conventional Heston one. Which, so it's an integral of a function g times the forward variance curve, and you get this function g not by solving a Riccati ODE, as in the classical Heston case, but by solving a so-called Riccati Volterra equation, right? So this is an integral equation that needs to be solved. And you can recognize the classical Riccati equation here if this were an ODE. This basically collapses to an ODE in the special case of um, when you have an exponential kernel. Now, if you have a power law kernel, you also get some kind of collapse. This riccati volterra equation ends up turning into a fractional differential equation. In fact, I'm not really sure what all the fuss is about fractional uh, calculus in general. Um, it's basically just solving integral equations. I guess one of the reasons might be there are some rules for fractional calculus. I'm not sure how useful these rules are, but anyway, you end up with this thing called a fractional ODE. Uh, D alpha of H is a generalization of derivative of H with respect to time to fractional order. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, here's a one slide introduction to fractional calculus. Basically, we want fractional generalization of integration and differentiation. And what does it mean? Well, imagine that we were to integrate a function n times, by which I mean you integrate it once, then you integrate the integral, then you integrate the integral, and so on, n times. Well, there's a well-known formula for this. It, if you integrate the function n times, you get 1 over n minus 1 factorial integral power law kernel times the function, right? So the magic parallel kernel coming out. And what's the obvious generalization to a non-integral n? Well, it's just you put alpha minus 1 here, and you have, well, yeah, n minus 1. And this is gamma of n, right? So you just put gamma of alpha here. So that's the natural. This is just natural uh, generalization of integrating n times to non-integral alpha and then to get 
the derivative. Obviously, it's just the inverse of the integral. Okay, and now a little bit about microstructure or foundation of the rough heston model. The rough heston model emerges as the continuous limit of a Hox process-based model of order flow as jumps become smaller and more frequent. I mean, we had a conversation over coffee. Essentially, um, if you scale the jumps by square root of epsilon and you, sc you scale the arrival rate of the jumps as one over epsilon and you take the limit epsilon goes to zero, if you're not careful in that limit, as I said before, you will get Brownian motion with constant volatility, but in the very precise case where the Hox process is nearly unstable, the limit of this is rough Heston, if you have a parallel kernel in the Hox process. What do I mean by parallel kernel in the Hox process? Well, as we've said, it's a self-exciting Poisson process. So a biorder comes, then it's more likely that another biorder is gonna come. If another biorder doesn't come, how does the initial excitement decay? Well, if it decays as a power law, that's the kernel describes how quickly these ex excitations decay. So this gives us a clue as to why rough volatility appears to be universal. And uh, we show, in general, how any Hox process-based model of order flow relates to stochastic volatility model in the limit. So given a Hox process-based model of this form, we can show you what a fine stochastic volatility model results. And if you want to find, if you want to have one of these Heston models, or, uh, you know, a appear as the limit of a nearly unstable Hox process, we'll tell you which Hox process to use to get that stochastic volatility model. So we have the mapping. So there exist a number of standard numerical techniques such as the Adams scheme and also Martino, Martino scheme, but maybe it's not so slow, so maybe I should change this. I'm gonna change this. <laughs> we take advantage of the technology Maybe Martinos is not slow. Uh, so now, these uh, numerical procedures are too much work for us and too slow. So I wanted to see, I'd done a lot of work because I hated the Adam scheme so much Omar Elush kept showing me the Adams scheme and they kept saying, oh, this is standard technique, this is fast. But to me, it was incredibly slow. Wouldn't you agree, Martino, it's incredibly slow and inaccurate with any reasonable number of time steps. So I kept trying different tricks to see if we could, and amazingly, this simple trick here works amazingly well. We just do rational approximation of the solution of the integral equation. Remember, in order to get closed form characteristic function, we need to compute this function g. The function g is a solution of a fractional ODE. Um, and we can't solve that in closed form, right? So we need a numerical scheme, the Adams scheme or Martino's new hybrid scheme, which I haven't tried yet. Um, but it's a numerical scheme. I hate numerical schemes in general. Let's see if we can get an accurate um, closed form approximation. And in that paper, which I just mentioned with Radosh in my department, we, uh, we showed how to do this. Now, if you've got this rational, and I give you the code, by the way, so if you're suspicious as to whether it really works, you have the code. Now, if I give you the characteristic function, how can you get the price, and therefore, how can you get the implied volatility? Well, there's this beautifully simple formula. Now, somebody's probably gonna object. There are many different ways of getting the option price directly from the characteristic function, but all the alternatives have serious deficiencies compared to this one. So, for example, if you use the standard technique, you have to use a different formula for puts and calls. Also, notice that the integrand is real. So, numerically, this is amazingly simple to implement and appears to always work nicely. It's not optimal, but it works very, very nicely. And I prove this in the book if you're interested. So now implementing it is very, very straightforward. 
as you can see, just also notice that in R, and I assume it's the same in Python, but R is so much more concise, um, complex numbers are really easy. So here we, this is I, one I, and integrating, well, that's also really easy. I can integrate this integrand from zero to infinity. There's no problem. So now let's uh, compute the approximate rough Heston characteristic function, and we choose the rough Heston parameters to be roughly equivalent to the rough Bergomi parameters that we already cooked up there. In particular, we expect the vol of all in the rough Heston model to be of the order of the vol of all in the rough Bergomi model times the square root of variance, right? So remember, we set that to be 16 vol flat. So it should be 2.5 times 0.16, which is 0.4. And actually, having said we're going to do that, I actually played with the numbers. So I didn't do what I said. I actually played with the numbers a bit more. And here's, well, th I just computed the characteristic function, by the way, if you're wanting to know. Uh, so that's how fast it was. And so now, let's draw the smile. Uh, took me one second to draw the entire smile. And so that's our rough Heston model solution. And again, it draws a smile. So which smile is better? Not sure. Rough Bergomi smile or rough Heston smile, that's work that's still to be done. I conjecture that it's possible to tell just by looking at the uh, shape of the smile which model is better, but this work has not been done yet. So now we can superimpose the two, and what can you tell from this? Nothing much. They just generate similar smiles. So in other words, I have picked my parameters reasonably well. The rough Heston smile is in green, and the rough Bergomi smile is in red. So I'm sorry? Well, it's the same. I mean, their parameters basically have the same meaning, right? It's, uh, you have three parameters. H, well, that has the same meaning in both models. Vol of vol, well, up to a rescaling by square root of variance, they're the same. And then the correlation between spot moves and vol moves. They appear to have slightly different meaning in the two models. In other words, in order to get these smiles to match, I had rho equal minus 0.9 in the rough Bergomi model and rho equal minus 0.5 in the rough Heston model. And that's probably because when we wrote the spot process, somehow we're not doing it quite right. There's a different way of writing the spot process, which would be more natural. But this, again, is work to be done. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one year. Yeah. Well, it's the same. I mean, it doesn't depend. Yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah, that's right, that's right. And so, yeah. So to, in order to get this accuracy with the Adam scheme in our paper, we needed to use 50,000 Adam steps. So this would take forever to compute. I don't know how, how, how long you're hybrid scheme. But your hybrid scheme also depends on the maturity, right? Yeah, but less Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're, you're better coding, that coding. Than, you know, if I code, if I had the same coder as you, mine would be much faster than yours. <laughs> um, so the point is here, the rough Bergomi and rough Heston implementations are both straightforward. And the point I want to stress to you, if you're a student or even an academic, is that this is not just theoretically the case. I'm not just claiming this to be the case. I'm giving you the code. So I strongly urge you to play with the code afterwards. So now we are going to apply this. And I think I'm going to finish early again. George, you need to help me by asking questions, right? Because we're going too fast here. No problem. No problem, OK. So right now. A, let's look at one day in history. Um, and so you can see because the rough Heston model is so fast to compute, in particular, it's easy to calibrate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we use the Adam's cycle as a benchmark. 
That's right. Well, as far as we could tell, in order for us, so uh, I used like I think 200,000 time steps in the Adam scheme. It took forever in the, in the cloud to get this to compute, and this is my benchmark. Okay. And, and you got closer, close to the Yes, yes. Almost identical for every expiration. So again, I don't know why. So now this, because I'm going too fast, let me digress about this beautiful rational approximation. I'm so happy with it. No reason to be so happy because it's kind of like an accident, right? So when you have a rational approach, what's the idea? The idea was we know how to expand the solution to this uh, rough, uh, to this fractional ODE to get the characteristic function. We know how to expand this for short times. Uh, this is essentially Adams in some sense, but the approximation is very poor. We also know the solution for long times. Uh, again, solution not very accurate. So we paste them together using rational approximation. And so it means we have some polynomial on the top and some polynomial in the bottom. It turns out only diagonal approximates are appropriate for this problem. And so then, okay, so let's have a quadratic on the top and a quadratic in the bottom. Let's have a cubic in the top, a cubic in the bottom, a quartic on the top, quartic in the bottom, and so on and so on. Which one is best? So it turns out to be the 3-3 three, three diagonal approximate that is more or less perfect. 2-2 two, two is worse. Okay, you say, well, that's normal. It's lower order. 4-4 four, four is worse. And then one of the referees said, well, how can you just stop? And, uh, well, because, okay, 3-3 three, three was so good. That's the answer. So then... We went to 5.5 five and 6.6. Six. Okay, so 5.5 five is better than 4.4, four, four, better than 2.2, two, two, but it's not as good as 3.3. Three, three. And it's much slower than 3.3 three, three because it's more complicated to compute. The same with 6.6. Six. So the conclusion is it could be 7.7 seven, seven is better than 3.3. Three, three. It could be, but it's much slower than 3.3. Three, three. So 3.3 three, three is like the magical choice. Now, when you go back into the literature and you ask, okay, what are the convergence results on these Paddy approximates? Does anybody know? It appears that nobody knows. This is like a cooking recipe. And applied mathematicians know that these rational approximations are wonderful. And pure mathematicians had all sorts of wonderful conjectures on the convergence of these things. As far as I can tell, every single one of these conjectures has been proven false. Now, uh, physicists like also rational approximations, and one particular physicist wrote a very nice story. He said, okay, you can compute, for example, in a typical problem, the first 50 diagonal approximates, right? So you go 1-1 one, one, all the way to 50-50, and he says out of the first 50, five of them are going to be horrible. Five of them are going to be wonderful, and the other 40 will be fine. <laughs> but, you know, predicting in advance, which one is going to be the great one? He says, nobody knows. You know, proving that the five best are converging even to the solution, nobody had success. There was a counterexample to that conjecture. So we were just incredibly lucky that 3-3 happened to be the great one. Okay, so now I'm losing track as to whether I actually computed this or not. So here are my cal calibrated parameters. Okay, so now I'm gonna take some real data. And thanks to Georges' fervent prayers, this is all working. <coughs> so what, what does my raw data look like? So that, that if you want to use my plot iVols function that allows you to visualize the vol surface, your data needs to be in this format so specifically, this, we don't care about these. You need to have time to expiration in years. You need to have the strike, the bid vol, the offer vol, the forward price. Uh, you don't need these, but you need model vol. If you want to superimpose the model fit, uh, you need this one. Okay, so now I take this data and I plot it. Here we go. Boom. Okay, so now you would need micro, well, so this is just the raw data at this point, there's no model fit. But one thing you will notice is, it's important to calculate your implied vols correctly. 
it's amazing how many people, especially people who do commercial software, don't know how to compute implied volatilities, right? It's so the key, in particular for these European options, is to use put call parity to determine the forward price. If you do that, you see the data is just beautiful quality. The red points uh, denote bid implied vols and the blue points denote offer implied vols. As you can see, unlike the 2005 case, we have like uh, 35 different expirations on this particular day in history. So in order uh, to compute smiles, we need the forward variance curve. And to get the forward variance curve, we need the variance curve. And we use uh, the Fukasawa robust methodology to compute uh, the variance curve. It's not very accurate, but it's uh, very robust. And so that's what we do. Alternatively, you can use a parameterization of the smile. And in the old days, I would use, use SVI, but SVI just doesn't fit anymore. So you need something more sophisticated. So just using Fukasawa's robust methodology, which is incredibly simple to implement, and again, I give you the code, so no excuse not to use it. Here's what you get for the forward variance curve. Uh, not the forward variance curve, the variance rate Sorry. curve. Can you expand why SVI does not work anymore? It is simply that uh, the, this was another conversation that we had during the coffee break. Essentially, uh, the S&P market got more liquid. There are many more players involved. In fact, uh, your name is Carlo, right? Luca, so close. <laughs> Luca was talking about the kind of trades that he does in his hedge fund. Basically, you're using the earnings of individual companies in the S&P to put on trades in the S&P. This kind of resolution of future events would not have been possible before because the bid offer spreads were too wide and there wasn't enough liquidity. Now this market is just incredibly liquid with tight bid offers. People are putting on these kind of trades and simple power laws, these simple patterns are just no longer there. They're there in the big picture if you're willing to be drunk and fuzz out all the detail, but there's real detail in the S&P volatility surface that reflects this kind of trade that's being done. Does that answer the question? Yeah. So anyway, th this is uh, the variance rate curve. In other words, uh, total variance divided by time to expiration. And now I'm going to create the forward variance curve. So basically all I'm doing is I'm differencing this. So it's the most naive thing that you could think of doing and I'm sure everyone here will be able to think of a smarter way of doing this. So this is my estimate of the forward variance curve and because I did this in such a naive way, all the errors in my, uh, all my, all the errors in my variance swaps of course are going to be uh, exaggerated and you get this crazy uh, rough forward variance curve, I shouldn't use the word rough here, um, but then out here it looks a bit better. But it's good enough for our purposes. So this is my piecewise linear approximation. Now, um, I want to be able to type in rough Heston parameters and get out the implied volatility. To, so what does this function do? It takes my rough Heston approximation in order to compute the characteristic function and then just computes the implied vol using that Lewis formula and then using a Black-Scholes implied vol computation, which is just bisection. Now, let's hope that this runs. Yeah, there we go. So that's an example. And also notice that I've put error trapping because sometimes that integral that's required to get the option price from the characteristic function, sometimes that integral just doesn't work numerically. Um, it always works when you need it to work, but you know we're doing calibration and stuff, so it doesn't always work, so we need to trap the errors. Right, so now we're gonna pop, well, I, we're not gonna run this because it takes too long. So I'm gonna cheat and use data that I already uh, computed, so you can see I've already compute, I've already populated this column here with a computation that took me seven minutes to run. And then finally, we can superimpose 
the model smiles on the actual smiles. And uh, unless you have x-ray vision at the back, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between these two. So the least that we can say is that big picture, the rough Heston model fits the vault surface amazingly well. But we can't tell a lot from here. So now let's. Uh, well, here, here it is, right? So here's a short term one. It fits pretty well, but you know, not so good here, right? So out of the money, it's not fitting the market smile. Here, by the time you get to one month, it's not too bad. And for longer dates, it's great. Okay, you're gonna argue, well, it misses here and it misses here, but this is really not too bad, right? It basically matches the vol surface everywhere, quote unquote, reasonably well, everywhere, with almost no parameters, right? Just H, vol of vol, and correlation between spot moves and vol moves. And you can do the same thing with rough, Virgo, rough Brigomi, you'll get similar results. Now, here's a subtlety uh, for those of you who are actually interested in playing with this stuff. We estimated variance swaps using some methodology. Uh, however, once we fit the model and we re-estimate variance swaps using the model, we're not going to get the same number. And the way, that, the way that's going to uh, show up in the data is that if we look carefully, although it's very hard to see here, you're going to find that the at-the-money vols don't match the at-the-money vol in the data. Now, of course, it's a question as to whether you really want to match the at-the-money vols in the data, but if you did, you would just need to iterate. This can be done. I mean, if your code is fast, um, you can do it. So this function plot i vols, it has, it outputs an estimate of the empirical at the money vol as part of the function. Uh, here we go. So then I've plotted a model at the money vol versus empirical at the money vol. Oh, okay, so that didn't work. Uh, let's see, here we go. Sorry, Jim, I may be tired, but let me ask, why, why is it clear that they don't match? Uh, well, it's clear because of this picture. Let me show you again, and hopefully this time it will work. So these are my empirical at the money vols, and no, it doesn't work. But anyway, in the picture before, you saw they were different. There was a blue line and a red line. They're just different numbers, right? Because in order to get, uh, in order to fit my model, I needed a forward variance curve. Where did the forward variance curve come from? It came from my robust estimate of the variance swap levels. But this robust estimate of the variance swap levels, it takes the visible smile which goes from a minimum strike to a maximum strike, and then it cuts off the rest flat. But of course, my model doesn't do that. It fits in the middle, and then it extrapolates forever. So in general, the model is going to give me a higher variance swap than my robust estimate. And so in order to match the at the money vols, I'm going to just have to iterate. So in practice, uh, so we can iterate on the forward variance curve to match at the money vols if we want. Um, in, pra in practice, it's reasonably fast and it doesn't substantially alter the quality of the fit. So in other words, once you've got the parameters, right, you, you could ask yourself the following thing. Suppose now we've got the parameters and now I change the forward variance curve. Should I redo the fit and get different parameters? Well, you can try this experiment. It really doesn't change the optimal choice of parameters. Now, something that Marcos was talking about earlier, uh, in Imperial they are boasting that they can fit the rough Bergomi model incredibly fast. How do they do this? Well, I don't know is the answer, but I'm gonna guess how they do this. They do this by estimating H from VIX futures. Once you've estimated H, if you think about the hybrid scheme, the hard part of the hybrid scheme is just to generate the riemann neuville process. And if you remember, that process depends only on H. So once you've fixed H, the slow part of the generation 
of rough Birgomi prices is done. Iterating on the vol of all and the correlation is very fast. So that's why they can get almost instantaneous. What was the, they quoted like point something of a second? Less than one second calibration of the rough Birgomi model. So if you have H, that's the trick. So how do you get H from the VIX futures? And of course, this is also interesting to I see. I see Luca here like staring at this slide. He, he wants to know how can he trade VIX futures using this model? Well, here's the answer. Um, obviously, this model has implications for how VIX futures should trade. It's spe uh, specifically, what should the term structure of VIX futures be? Um, right. Uh, so the rough Heston model obviously generates downward sloping VIX smiles, completely inconsistent with the market. The rough Bergomi model generates flat VIX smiles, which is also inconsistent, but not quite as bad. Nevertheless, uh, we can compute VIX futures and hope for the best. And essentially what we do is we make a number of approximations approximations that were subsequently justified in a paper by Antoine Jacquier and his friends, uh, Claude Martini and his student, Aitor Muguruza. Um, okay, so now I'm accelerating again. So the point is that the VIX and its square uh, should be approximately log normally distributed. And then if they're no log normally distributed, in order to characterize the entire distribution, we need only the mean and the variance. And the mean is the VIX, we have that. The mean is the VIX squared to be more precise or the variance swap. And uh, the variance is easy to approximate, right? So we can ap approximate the conditional variance of VIX squared. Here we go. <laughs> We're having no luck today. Right, so this is the expression for the variance. You can see it's a simple integral to compute numerically. You can even compute it in closed form. You get some kind of hypergeometric, but that's obviously pointless. It's slower to call the hypergeometric function than it is just to integrate this numerically. And uh, so here's the story, here's the final result. We can get the adjustment um, using this formula, right? So the variance of the log of VIX is given by this expression where F is that function that's easy to compute. So then we get the approximate fair value of VIX futures That's the formula, right? So this is the fair value of VIX. And what about this thing under the square root? Where do we get that from? Well, this is a constant strip of VIX options, right? Because if VIX is the underlying, VIX squared is the forward variance swap, right? Which is the thing that we need in here. And that's just a strip, constant strip of VIX futures. Generates the square. And then we've just computed this variance thing so this gives the convexity adjustment, right? So fair value of the VIX future is given by the square root of the forward variance swap times this convexity adjustment. So now you know what's the fair term structure of VIX futures. Or conversely, from the fair term structure of VIX futures, we can determine H. Now when we do this, when we did this in our paper, we did something kind of equivalent. Uh, we found that the vol of vol implied by VIX uh, options is rather smaller than the vol of vol implied by S&P options. I have this sentence in the paper that the, the referee hated. The sentence says something like, uh, either our model is wrong or the market is wrong or both. And the referee said, what does this sentence mean? Well, to me, it's pretty clear what the sentences mean. This <laughs> sentence stayed in the paper. And I remember a hedge fund guy visiting me, and he didn't tell me what trade he was doing. It's really annoying to me, because I'm sure it's a very simple trade. He was just laughing at me.
Right. All right. Let's talk later. I like this. This is exactly the trade, right? So basically saying Volovol is higher in S&P than it is in VIX means I should be selling puts on S&P and buying calls on the VIX. Now, there's a hand-waving argument why there should be a difference. Uh, so, for example, it's a bit of a digression, but I can take more time now with all this technology yeah. stuff and your fervent prayer. I can take time. So if you're a client and you want to hedge against some disaster for your business, a hedge fund, you want to hedge against everything, what do you do naturally? You buy a call on VIX, right? But you could also buy a put on S&P. Why not? A problem with buying a put on S&P is almost always what will happen, almost surely, to use the mathematical term, mm -hmm. almost surely what will happen to you is the market keeps going up, just nice and gently, and your put goes out of the money. So in order to make your put meaningful, you've got to sell the old one and buy a new one. And it costs money for you to keep rolling this position. So calls on VIX should, in principle, be more expensive. What we're really saying here is that calls on VIX are cheaper. So it's a mystery to me why. Supply. Supply. OK, I need to talk to you for sure. Yes. Right. So? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Which uh, one is cheaper? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, let's talk about this later. I need to, I think it's more complicated than I can understand in 30 seconds. But this all sounds very interesting. Anyway. It's uh, something that's been annoying me a lot, is uh, exactly how to do this optimally. Now, um, you might wonder whether implied model parameters are consistent with historical parameters. I mean, certainly, this has been a recurrent criticism of classical stochastic volatility models, is that the implied parameters are totally different from the historical ones. And it turns out, for this model, they are similar, right? So we can go do the calculation here from our pricing paper. Here are two sets of parameters. And it turns out that although H and vol of all, because of the stupid way we formulated the model probably, because H and vol of all separately, they move around, the product eta times square root of 2H stays pretty consistently, same number, right? So it's about 0.7. Well, that's two days in history, so for a physicist, that's universal, it's good enough. So let's say it's 0.7 uh, implied. Then we can go compute the same number historically. And I'm going to skip through this. And from lecture one, remember, we got that H was about 0.15, and vol of vol is about 0.3. And when you plug those in, you get 0.25. Well, I mean, the reason I'm showing you this is because this is an error that uh, we got confused by. Say, how come they're so different? Until you realize that all these parameter estimates, well, obviously this is dimensionless, but this thing has a time scale, right? This thing is a daily number, and in our option implied calculation, it's an annualized number. So you have to, you have to uh, convert daily to annual, and when you do that, you get something like 0.58. And for me, I don't know for you, but 0.58 and 0.7 are pretty much the same number, good enough. By physicist standards, it's the same thing. Right, so now, um, we can have any number of uh, rough volatility models, obviously. Uh, anything of this form where we have some function of we don't know what of the forward variance curve and some kernel. So long as this kernel has the right singularity as t goes to u, it's going to be a rough volatility model. So you can have each one of you here can make your own rough volatility model. And in particular, for those people who are econometricians 
and they love long memory, you can have long, you can have long memory. And in fact, Mikko Pakkanen explores this in a paper that was entitled something like Decoupling Long Memory and Rough Volatility or something. I can't remember the exact title. But the idea is that your kernel can have the rough volatility property and it can also have the, uh, the long memory property. I jokingly call this the HCE kernel, the have your cake and eat it kernel, right? Because you can have both. Right, so this is the form of the kernel. So the one over tau to the gamma, this is what gives you the, the rough volatility. And then the one plus tau to the beta, this for beta sufficiently big, this is the thing that allows you to get long memory. Uh, oh, I, so I thought I was gonna present something else, which I didn't, but now this is a good time to finish anyway. So in lecture one, Scaling properties of the time series of historical vols suggested a natural non-Markovian stochastic volatility under P. So what was that model? It's basically log of vol is equal to fractional Brownian motion. Roughly speaking, that's the model. Then we change measure in this lecture and we say, okay, we argue, Vick's options tell us the change of measure has to be random. But this is too hard for us, so we just make it deterministic. And if we make it deterministic, like magic, we get a generalization of the classical Bergomi model. Uh, I would say a more beautiful version of the Bergomi model. And then obviously the question is, and I know that Bergomi asked himself this question back in 2005, if we replace the exponen exponential kernel with a parallel kernel, don't we end up with a model that's just impractical, impossible to use because we need the entire history of the Brownian motion uh, to be able to compute anything? And the answer is no. Uh, it turns out that all the information that we require to compute option prices is encoded in the forward variance curve. The for forward variances are traded objects. Variance swaps are traded objects. This thing can be just read off the options market. What's the origin of rough volatility? Well, the work of uh, Mathieu uh, indicates that certainly there is a microstructural explanation, so we probably should look to microstructure. Uh, people always ask me why, used to ask me why, I like to study two such different topics, and I always told them hand-wavingly that it's the same topic, microstructure and volatility are the same topic because what makes prices go up and down except trades, and now, thanks to Mathieu, we have the exact connection. Uh, we end up with this story, we end up with the rough Heston model. Rough Heston model is even more tractable than the classical Heston model, for those of you who like to do close form computations. And the characteristic function can be computed using a fast and accurate rational approximation for which I gave you the code. So we have simple tractable stochastic volatility models that are consistent with both the historical time series of volatility and the implied volatility surface. And as you saw, with very consistent parameters. So it's not like we have to magically change the size of the parameters to get this consistent description. It's basically the same parameters. If you go to our pricing paper, I thought I was gonna present this here, but fortunately, I calculated the time more or less correctly. In the paper, you'll see an example where we uh, project out forward variance curves and show how they uh, evolve after big events. And you can see that they evolve exactly consistently with this story. Well, how come? I mean, if people didn't know about rough volatility, how come they could already have been doing this right? Well, because it's just traders trading. And in my view, traders trading is just people doing regressions, very sophisticated regressions. And so people basically doing the right thing, just like Fulvio Corsi, without necessarily having a modeling framework for doing it. And with that, I'll finish. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Jim. So questions? Ah, I cannot go here, sorry. We'll have the other chance to ask questions. Let me make announcements before questions. Um, for people who stay in the hotel tonight, uh, 
dinner is included in the package because you're not having lunch on Thursday. So you eat today for Thursday not to have lunch. Just keep a you know, conservation of mass. Um, then the other thing is the posters are going to be here at five. So if you have posters, ask Sueli about how to set up the posters. The people who are being chairs for, who kindly accepted to be chair for the different panels, uh, make sure that you have the um, uh, presentations of the speakers for your set of panel or session, or whatever, uh, ready to go before you start. So uh, try to arrive like 10 or 15 minutes before to make sure that uh, things are okay. Uh, the, the way we run panels, for those that uh, don't remember, is we usually put the three speakers here, each one goes, and um, we're going to have a table there. And um, it's not there yet, Martina. Oh, hypothetically there. And, uh, and then uh, each one talks, and then we ask questions to everybody, and we have a small discussion. Okay, so, well, with that said, is there any further question for Jim? What time is dinner? What time is dinner? You caught me. You know, we might have to check. Uh, I don't know. I was wondering about that myself. <laughs> uh, my rough estimate no, is... No, don't say rough. Uh, well, <laughs> it, it's rough is the, is the topic of this course, Jim. So, so it should be around 7 p.m., 7.30 is a sure bet. After nine, I think it's unlikely. Before six, it's impossible in Brazil. It's illegal. <laughs> okay. All right. So, well, thank you very much right, again, thank you. Jim.